for here on this evening. I pray that me being down here and not being up there is not a distraction for you. Um, for those who know me, this is where I'm most comfortable, um, down here um, with you. And on tonight, I want to begin by sharing with you, like last night, a personal account that I had to witness. It goes back to when I had just finished doing a gospel meeting in San Antonio, Texas, and a young man came to me and he said, Sean Price, I am often impressed by your ability of not being shy or afraid to speak in public. And he asked the question, have you always been that way? I said, well, let me tell you about the first time I had the opportunity to speak. It goes back to when I was eight years old. And um, I was still part of a denomination, so was my grandmother. We didn't know any better. And um, she was giving me the responsibility of the infamous Easter speech. And she gave me six months to prepare for the Easter speech. She bought me a little suit, a little cute Bible to go with the suit. I had a little hat with a propeller on it. She was getting me ready for the Easter speech. Six months pass by and the day comes up. Here is the day. This is the day for the Easter speech. They called my name. I stood up and said, Merry Christmas. Because <laughs> I was absolutely nervous. But my grandmother, she didn't care that I said Merry Christmas during the Easter speech. She wasn't worried about that. All she was concerned with is that her grandchild spent a lot of time in preparation that her grandchild did all he can to ensure that he did well by his grandmother. She even told me that I was perhaps her best friend because she was so happy that I was pleased to try to serve God. Well, a year had passed and no more Easter speeches for me to say the least. And um, grandma had lost some of the energy that she usually had. I was over at her house and she was laying down on her bed in the afternoon one Saturday and she called me over, her voice is very faint, and she said, Sean, no matter what you do, you always stick with God. And then she kissed me right in the middle of my forehead. Now, of course, I'm nine years old, I'm trying to go outside to play. I said, yeah, yeah, grandma, yeah, okay, I got you. I want to go play. So I saw my grandma's house, it was this big baseball field. And children from all over would come over and play baseball. So we're out there playing baseball. But I began to notice that all of a sudden I saw cars pulling up in front of Grandma's house. And my uncle and my aunt walked in. And all of a sudden my mother and my father pulled up in their car and they walked in. And a few of my cousins, they pulled up in the car and they walked in. And I started thinking to myself, they having a party without me. So I ran top speed to the house and I walked in and the atmosphere was very stoic. Blank faces and blank stares is what I walked into. And I began to ask everyone who was there, what's going on? Why are all these people here at grandma's house? What am I missing? But no one would answer me. It was as if I was speaking to myself. So I thought to myself, if anyone who's going to tell me what's going on, it's my best friend, my bosom buddy, my grandmother. So I began to walk towards her room. Then all of a sudden, I was startled by the sound of the ambulance. And with me being the size that I was, as the paramedics rushed in, they pushed me to the side to get to where they were going. And I, was, I turned the corner to go into my grandmother's room and... I saw my mother walking out, and the tears began to well up in her eyes. And I read her lips, and she simply said, I did not even get to say goodbye. I got a chance to peek in the room, and I saw the paramedics giving CPR trying to resuscitate my grandmother. And all I saw was a limp arm hanging there. The first three seconds 
after death. The first three seconds after death. At this time, all I can remember thinking is one question. Where is she now? This shell laying on the bed is not my grandmother. The warmth and the tenderness, tenderness that is, that was not, it was no longer in that body. It was just a shell laying there. What happened to my grandmother? And it caused me as I grew into my adult years to always ask the question, what is it that happens to us once we all close our eyes for the very last time? What happens to us after we die? Well, to understand this, there are some things you have to learn about mankind. And the first thing to learn about mankind is that even though I am just one individual, there are three things that makes me who I am. I am a body, I'm a spirit, and I'm a soul. Now you say, how do you know that, Sean Price? Well, let's start in Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 7. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 7, which is a more detailed explanation of the creation account of mankind as written in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. In Genesis 2 and verse number 7, the Bible says that man was formed from the dust of the ground. That's the body. And then God breathed into his nostrils the breath or the spirit of life there's the spirit and then man became a living soul there's your soul body spirit and soul every last one of us in here has a body a spirit and a soul now what was laying on the bed in my grandmother's room was the body but the body is not who she is your body is not who you are as a matter of fact you don't have a soul you are a soul and you have a body see god puts emphasis on the soul of mankind because it's the soul of mankind that does not die but your body as promised will go back to the dust of the ground. But oftentimes we focus on the body. I'm not gonna say no names, but this morning uh, we was focusing on the body. And it's okay to be in shape, to be healthy, to be a good steward of what God has blessed you with. That's okay. But your emphasis should be on the thing that God has given you which is more valuable than the whole entire world, and that is your soul. And because every man and woman and child in this room has a body, a mind, and soul, we need to understand our responsibility with those faculties. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 23, the apostle Paul writing there, he will say that he wills that our body will be holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, sanctified or set apart. And then he talks about the body, the spirit, and the soul. So what does it mean to have those faculties set apart? That means that God endeavors for each one of our faculties to be involved with something concerning him. Our bodies, for example... When you look at Romans chapter 12 and verse number 2, God says, verse 1 that is, God says our bodies are to be living sacrifices. So God has an intent for our bodies. Our bodies is not designed to be used for sin. Our bodies is not designed to be satisfying to the flesh. But our bodies are designed to do everything that we do for everything that we say to the glory of God. That's why we have a body. And when it comes to our soul, James chapter 1 and verse number 22, God wills for our souls to be saved. And it's saved by what is written in the word of God. 
That is God's willful intent for the soul. And when it comes to the spirit, God's will, according to Romans chapter 8 and verse number 16, God wills for the spirit of mankind to be in sync with his spirit. Now let me explain that because I don't want to get too deep. The spirit that God gave man not only gave mankind the ability to live, but the spirit of man is also the sentient or the understanding faculty of man. Job 32 and verse number 8, the Bible says that the spirit, of, uh, there's a spirit of a man by which the inspiration of the Almighty provides them understanding. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 11, we learn that the spirit of an individual is what tells what's going on inside an individual. Which means that the spirit and the mind in that particular context is one and the same. And God wills for the spirit of man, the sentient part of man, to be in sync with his spirit. Now the way that happens is not by any miraculous thing. You're not going to hear a whisper in your ear. Nothing's going to go bump in the night. But according to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 17, the Bible teaches that the word of God is the sword of the spirit. And the sword of the spirit, the word of God, is the instrument that the spirit uses to influence those who are willing and open to follow what thus saith the Lord. Friends and brethren, this is not in the sermon, but let me say this, and I stand dogmatically, and I say it firmly, that you cannot be led by the spirit absent from the word of God. Amen. If you close the Bible, you have no spirit. So the Spirit, is, it instructs you through the Word. There are some brethren out there who are teaching some false stuff. They will claim that the Spirit operates directly upon the heart and it tells you what you can and cannot do. I just dropped by to tell you when you filter this through hermeneutics, that is inference, example, and command, there is no way whatsoever in doctrine do you come out with that premise. But God wills that your mind is influenced by what he has written in his word. That means that if my mind, my spirit is being led by the spirit, I have an open Bible and what the Bible says do, I will do. What the Bible says don't do, I will not do. And I know there's some confusion with that. Someone asked the question, how do we know what to do and what to apply from the Bible? Well, it's very simple. Either God is going to tell it to you explicitly. For example, preach the gospel. That's explicit. That's an imperative statement. It's like me telling my daughter, clean your room. It's not a suggestion. It's not a question. It's an imperative statement. And her job is to come, is to, is, is to, um, um, Follow or obey what I have commanded in the exact same way when God gives an explicit command, we are to follow what he has said. Or we have an approved example. Acts chapter 20 and verse number 7. Upon the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. So since we have the approved example of when they broke bread, then we follow that same approved example. So therefore we meet on the first day of the week to break bread. How you get Saturday night out of that, I don't know. How you get the first Sunday only out of that, I do not know. Because the last time I checked, there's a first day of the week every week. And then we look at the consistency of that. I find it very strange that they go to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 and 2, and they want your offering on the first day of the week every week. But when it comes to the communion, it's just the first Sunday. Hey, as often as I take my cracker, you get my money. And it's first day of every, of every week. That's a proof example. And necessary inference caused some confusion. HD and I had this conversation today that behind every explicit command, you have your necessary inference. For example, preach the gospel. That's explicit. 
So we necessarily infer that we don't preach politics, we don't preach gossip, we don't preach ourselves, but we preach the gospel. That's necessary inference. When the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 19, as harmed out with Colossians chapter 3 verse 16 and Hebrews 13 15, how we are to praise God by the fruit of our lips, that is singing unto God, we necessarily infer that that excludes everything else. That's necessary inference. You know, that's one of the key questions I always get. You, you, you Church of Christ folk, y'all just can't stand instruments. Y'all don't like pianos. You don't like guitars. No, I like pianos. I like guitars, but I love God. And God has not authorized that. You know, I had to paint a picture to my daughter one day. You know, she asked, what does it mean about God authorizing something? And I said, well, honey, let me put it to you this way. Let's say, for example, you have company come over to the house and you go get them a cup of water. And then when you come back, you find them in your bed, jumping on your bed with their shoes on and mud all over their shoes. And then you say to your friend, what in the world are you doing? And then your, your, your friend replied by saying, well, you didn't say that I couldn't do this. So therefore, I felt that I just can do it. You will throw your friend out, they'll never come to your house ever again, and I just dropped by to tell you that's what God needs to do to those who will say that you don't have to have authority to do things in his church. This don't belong to mankind, this belongs to God. And it's God who tells us what we can and cannot do in his church. And when I point to this, I'm not talking about this building, I'm talking about the system of belief. That pattern is not what we have created, but it's what God has created. He has spoken from the portals of heaven that we may obey it down here on earth, that we may find ourselves living with him for eternity in heaven above. That's how we know what to apply. But that's only going to work when your mind is in sync with the word of God. That's what God wills for the spirit of man. Now, what does all that mean? Well, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 will come up and catch you. And now every last one of us, we will have to close our eyes in death. We all have an appointment that we cannot cancel. You can't call and say you're running kind of late. When your appointment with death comes up, it's going to happen. And what happens in that process, according to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse number 7, your body goes back to the dust of the ground. The spirit goes back to God in which it came. And in Psalm 1610, your soul goes to hell. Now someone said, wait a minute. My soul goes to hell? I didn't do anything wrong. Of course not. Hell is a term that is used a number of different ways in the Bible. And the hell that I'm, return, that I'm referring to is also known as Hades or the Hadean ram. That's where your soul goes. You say, preacher, that sounds good, but can you prove it? Yeah, I can prove it. Look at Jesus. When Jesus died in Luke 23 and verse number 46, we see that when Jesus died, the Bible says, into thy hands I commend thy spirit. So the spirit went back to God. And then in Luke 23, verse 52 and 53, we see that Jesus' body was taken down and it was buried in a tomb. So there's the burial of the body. And then in Acts chapter 2, verse 31, we see that his soul was not left in hell. So if that prime example is there, it's with Jesus. But how about you and I? How about you and I? How about my grandmother? When we had her funeral, her spirit went back to God. How do I know that? Because in James 2, 26, the body without our spirit is dead. So the spirit went back to God already. We had her funeral. We buried her body. 
in the ground. But where did her soul go? And to better illustrate this biblically, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 16, and where it started in verse number 19. Luke chapter 16, starting in verse number 19. And I'll be reading from the King James transliteration of the Bible. But the Bible says there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fare sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gates full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Now, we're going to get to Hades in a second, but I need you to understand what's going on here. What you see here is the comparison of two men before the grave. The grave has not come yet. You have one man who is rich, purple, fine linen, and he fared sumptuously. And you have another man named Lazarus. He's poor. And I found it a very interesting comparison that was on the rich man's skin. It's purple and fine linen. But what's on Lazarus' skin is sores and dog saliva. A disparity. And then when you think about the cultural idea about this, the name Lazarus is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew name Eleazar, which means that Lazarus is a Jewish man. And then when you look at this same text, you will see that the rich man is going to refer to Abraham as Father Abraham. A Gentile wouldn't say that. So this rich man, he's a Jewish man. So there's no problem with the man being rich. If you got money, to God be the glory, loan me a dollar. You having money is not sinful. But is you not helping someone who's in need, that's where you start having a problem. When you see someone who needs a hand up and not a hand out, but you say, no, not my money, that's where you have a problem. We are to be about the business like the church was in the first century, to where has every individual have need. We are sharing what we have to ensure that our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ are well taken care of. So when you don't share what you have for those who are in need, that's when you have issues. And that's why I see with this rich man and Lazarus. Now, watch what happens. Even though the rich man had money and Lazarus didn't have money, the common denominator took place in verse number 22. The Bible says, and it came to pass that the beggar died. It was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Now, picture it. Now, I don't want to hurt nobody on this side. But you guys over here, you are Abraham's bosom. This is where Lazarus went, to Abraham's bosom. So you are all little Lazarus. Then the Bible says, watch this, the rich man also died and was buried. Now, what I find interesting is this. You can have money, social status, education, all the friends in the world. But when you die, all that stuff is worth a hill of beans. Most gladly, you brought nothing into this world and you will not take anything out with you. You can waste all, I don't want to say waste, you can spend all your time you want to, working overtime after overtime, spending time away from your family. You can spend all the time you want to trying to compile up all this stuff. But let me tell you something, when you're laying on your deathbed, there are two questions you have on your mind. Is my God pleased with me and is my family going to be okay? No man lays on his deathbed wishing that he had spent more time at the office. So it doesn't matter how much you have. 
What matter is how well you're doing when it comes to God's will. So they both died and the rich man was also buried. And the Bible says, and, and in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in, watch this, torments. You guys over here, this is all torment, sorry. And don't try to leave your seat and come sit over here to Abraham's bosom because I'm going to show you in a second you can't do that biblically anyway. So Abraham's bosom, we have torment. Watch the request. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Y'all are all hot and thirsty. And all the rich man wanted was for someone from over here to dump their finger in water and just give them a little drop of water to cool their tongue. Now you may ask the question, why can't they just go and get the water themselves? Why can't they do that? Well, watch this. But Abraham says, son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you, they cannot. Neither can they pass to us that will come from thence. So this whole pathway right here, this is the great gulf. And the great gulf is designed for those who are in torment after the grave. You cannot get it right then. Your opportunity to get it right is before the grave. If the grave catch you before you get it right, you cannot and you will not be able after the grave cross this great gulf to be in Abraham's bosom. Now this is also called paradise as well in the Bible. What this does, it destroys the doctrine of purgatory. Purgatory is a false doctrine. After you die, all bets are off. That's why you have to stay ready that you don't have to get ready. Because James chapter four, verse 14 has not left the Bible your life is but a vapor and you have no idea when your appointment is. As a matter of fact, each and every last one of us can walk out of this building, an airplane can fall from the sky and we can all drop dead tonight. And the question is, if that was to take place, where will you be the first three seconds after death? Will you be in paradise? Abraham's bosom or will you be in torment which is also known as Tartarus where will you be someone just said tartar sauce I didn't say tartar sauce <laughs> Tartarus where will you be the first three seconds after death well watch this the first request was for Abraham to send Lazarus over to dip the figure in the, in the water. And Abraham said, no, nah, he can't do that. Look at verse 27. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, 
that I would have sent him to my father's house. So, so the first time, I want you to just send him over here to me. You can't do it. So if, if you can't come over to me to help comfort me, send him to my father's house. Now, now look what's happening here. The rich man has already accepted the fact that now that I am in torment, now that I can't get across the great gulf, I cannot change my position, I cannot change my circumstance, and as a matter of fact, what people are doing on the other side of the grave, they cannot change my circumstance neither. Now why do I say that? Because there are many people in the world today, they refuse to obey the gospel of Christ, because they believe if they do what thus saith the Lord, that by some strange way, that gives them the power to make their loved one move from being in paradise to being in torment. That's why they won't do it. But what you're missing is, while you're concerned, about your loved one who already understands that their condition cannot change because it's after the grave, your loved one is concerned about you because you still have the opportunity to do it correctly. Now, this is what I struggle with. You see, my grandmother was my best friend, and she died in a denomination. It drove me to tears when I heard the truth. I fought against it. Not my buddy. Not grandma. She was a good woman. Not my best friend. She just kissed me on the forehead and told me to stick with God. How was she in torment? I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to obey the gospel because I'm not going to put my grandma in that bad place. But the gospel preacher who was teaching me very tactfully asked me a question. If grandma was here with you right now, hearing what you were hearing right now, what will she have you to do? I said, sir, before she died, she kissed me on the forehead and told me to stick with God. She would have me obey the gospel. Then he said, in what greater way to honor her memory than to arise and be baptized into Christ. And what better way for you to keep the promise to stick with God would there be than for you to know that you're saved? Because let me tell you something. When somebody loves you, and I think about this because I'm a father. You know, I love my children. And the worst thing that can happen to me. Even worse than me seeing that I'm in torment is to hear a voice behind me that says, Daddy, is that you? What a huge responsibility that we have. Friends, you do not have the power to change the condition of those who've passed on already. But you do have the power to change your condition. That power has been given unto you by your obedience to the gospel of Christ. The same way you don't want your family member to be in a bad place, they don't want you to end up where they are already, if that is the case, if they are in a bad place. Look at the response that Abraham gives. He says, look, verse 28, Abraham, I'm a rich man speaking. For I have five brethren 
that he may testify unto them that they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. What he was saying there is that they have the revelation that has come by the writings of Moses and the prophets. Contextually, this is the Old Testament, of course. In the exact same respect, we have the revelation from God or what we must do if we don't want to end up in torment. If we want to be in paradise, we have to obey what thus saith the Lord. And what has God said? Guys, I've been doing this all week. And the word of God has not changed since Sunday morning. God has said the same thing over and over and over again. And I'm going to preach it over and over and over again. You must be taught the gospel of Christ. There's no way of getting around that. There is nothing else that God has given us on earth that's the power unto salvation besides the gospel of Christ. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 16. You must be taught that it's based upon the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. You must believe that. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6. Mark chapter 16, verse number 16. You must repent. Luke 13, 3. It's a change of mind that leads into a change of, a change of motion. And all of mankind is commanded to repent according to Acts 17 and verse number 30. Then once you repent, you are now in position to confess with your mouth that you do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Matthew 10, 32 is harmonized with Acts chapter 8 and verse number 37. Then once you make that confession, you must be baptized in water for the remission of sin. No baptism, no remission. You must be baptized to have your sins washed away. No baptism, no sins washed away. You must be baptized to be saved. No baptism, no salvation. You cannot separate baptism from salvation because the Bible does not separate baptism from salvation. Amen. And then the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 3, he will exhort us not to return back to sin. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. If you left the sin, leave the sin alone. And when you live a life of consistency based upon the love you have for God, when you're doing what was exhorted in Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 10, remaining faithful unto death, when you do what's talked about in Matthew 10, 22, enduring until the end, then when your eyes lay shut, for the very last time, the first three seconds after death, you will find yourself in paradise. And you can't do anything else but have joy and rejoice because you have followed the words of Jesus. And you'll be able to stand and shout from the mountaintops that Jesus Christ is indeed the Messianic master who is able to minister in my miseries in the midst of my messes. You can say that from the mountaintops because Jesus loves you and Jesus is real. And here's what's powerful about paradise. You know, someone asked the question, well, if, if, if people are going to be in paradise already and folks are going to be in torment already, then what's the reason for the judgment day? Well, let me explain like this. If H.D. Simmons goes out and kills six people, y'all better have some bail money, praise God. Cold blood murders six people. When they arrest them, they're going to hold them in the county jail. Now, he already knows 
He's messed up. There was five witnesses, six people dead. He's being held in the county jail. And then after that, there's going to be a trial where he must stand before the judge. And then the judge, once he's found guilty, is going to send him to the big house. When it comes to the reason why there's a judgment day, that when you die, the first three seconds after death, you go to the Hadian ram because you're being held there. But then when the Lord comes back, when the trumpet sounds, when the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then those remaining in Christ shall rise, when the Lord comes back, when the, when the Lord comes back and you see people who have not obeyed the gospel of Christ, who do not know God, and they have to face that fiery indignation, they have to face the wrath of God, Romans chapter 1, verse 18, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 through 9, when that happens, then you know where you're going to be for an eternity those in paradise that's the dead who in Christ who should rise first and they will be with God for an eternity and if you don't understand what eternity is it's longer than forever it's like forever ever 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 but those in torment the ones who have not obeyed you will find yourself in the final death, fiery condemnation forever, ever, 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 ever. When my grandmother passed away, the only solace that I had left was remembering the way that warm, tender kiss felt on my forehead. But I did not have the solace to say, at least I know that she's in a better place. Don't do your family like that. If you have not obeyed the gospel of Christ, if you're not thinking about yourself, at least think about them. Give them the solace to say, I know I saw them get baptized. I saw them be taught the gospel. I've been watching their lives. I've seen them living faithful unto death. I've seen it. So now my hope that they're going to be with God forever, at least I have that to lean upon. I didn't have that with Grandma. And it tears me up every time I think about it. I tearfully wrote this sermon because I thought about her. But I'll tell you this, even though I had a reason to be angry, even though I had a reason to be depressed, what it did was motivate me to begin to live more for God and motivate me to wake up every morning and thank God that I had the opportunity to hear that glorious gospel that was able to save my soul. I thank God every day that he gave me another chance to make things right. Let me tell you something. If you did something bad yesterday, God has blessed you with life today to correct the mistakes that you made yesterday. Everyone don't have that blessing, but we have that tonight. And when I lay my eyes to rest for the very last time, based upon my service and obedience to God, I have the confident hope that I'll be in paradise. Now as I close, let me pay the illustration of what paradise is for me as I close. You know, one of the things that Grandma did, she was able to make cakes from scratch make cakes you know she didn't go by Duncan Hines she didn't go by you name it she didn't go by that person she knew how to get the flour the sugar the vanilla abstract the eggs the milk 
She know how to stir in the bowl just right. I come in and sneak a little bit and eat some of that stuff. It was so good. She poured it in the pan. And she had put it in the oven. And the aroma of the cake would fill the house. And I'll run to it. I say, Grandma, is the cake ready? She would say, no, it's not ready yet. Because she knew exactly what was happening in the oven. So it was in the oven just baking. And then all of a sudden she would go get a toothpick. And she would put the toothpick right in the middle. And she would pull the toothpick out. And she would say, it's ready. And then she would pull the cake out of the oven. And then she had to allow it to cool down. And once the cake cooled down, then she would put the icing on the cake. When it comes to those who's in paradise, God knows when you're ready. God knows when it's time for you to come out of the oven. But when you come out of the oven, that's life. That's life before the grave. Now he puts you in the cooling off period. That's the Hadean ram. And you know while you're cooling off, you're just waiting for the Lord to come back. And when the Lord comes back, when he, the trumpet sounds, when you're rising up in the air, that's the icing on the cake. That's the glory you have when you've been obedient even unto death. That's the glory you have. I'm sad about grandma, but grandma is probably standing up applauding her favorite grandbaby, and she's probably saying, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. So I got joy. I cry because I love her. But I pray because I love him. And maybe you're here tonight. And maybe you've decided that you're not going to obey the gospel of Christ because the loved ones have passed on before you who did not obey it. They want you to do what's right. And you have the opportunity to do it tonight. Isn't that good news? That you could change your life tonight? Isn't that good news? that you can change your condition when it comes to the conversation of eternity? Isn't that good news? That the lie that Satan is saying, that all you're going to do is be bad, do bad, and end up in the devil's hell? Isn't it good that's a lie that God wants you to be saved? Some folks say that God is not going to condemn anybody to hell. You're absolutely right. God doesn't do that. We put ourselves there. We don't obey what he says in his word. But you can obey it tonight. Everybody didn't wake up this morning. Everybody is not at a gospel meeting to hear the gospel preached. But you are. Are you ready to be taught the gospel? Are you ready to believe it? Are you willing to repent? Are you willing to confess with your mouth that you do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Are you ready to go to the water to be baptized to have your sins washed away? Are you ready to make the commitment to be obedient, to sacrifice and to trust God? Are you ready for that? If you're ready, he's been ready. And he's been waiting for you for a very long time. So I don't know where you are tonight. This is my last night here. I don't know where you are tonight. Maybe you're saved already, and, and, but you know that there are some things you got to get together with God. And, and I tell you what's sweet about being a Christian. You ever read 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 through 9? The sweet blessing that God gives to a Christian. That when a Christian messes up and they're guilty of sin, all you got to do in verse 7 is repent. That is, walk in the light as he is in the light. Then once you repent, in verse 9, you pray to God to forgive you. And watch this. <laughs> the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive you. That's good news. And that's beautiful. But here's the question for you. What will your answer be tonight? Will you hold your pew? This evening? Or would you respond by saying to God, 
a resounding yes. So on this evening, if you have need for anything, we are asking and begging that you let it be known as we all stand and sing the Lord's song of invitation.